Um, so before I start, thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to Christina and Manuel for organizing. Thanks to the ambassador as well for inviting me. It's actually a real pleasure because I'm going to talk about something that I'm very familiar with. I'm from a region of Brazil where Festa Junina is a very strong um, cultural uh, festival. Um, and then so, yeah, it's actually my pleasure to be here talking about this. So just to start a, a little overview of uh, what I'm going to cover today, um, I'll just talk briefly about my journey. I'm from Brazil originally, and then I'll just explain what I've been doing here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the history, where this festival comes from, um, why it's done that way. Um, also some of the cultural elements that um, um, compose these um, this celebrities. Uh, celebrations. Um, a little bit about the music, the dance, and the, the gastronomy um, of the Festa Junina. So, I'm from Brazil, as you might have guessed so far. <laughs> and I'm from um, a small state in the northeast of Brazil called Paraíba. It's small, but actually it's bigger. Uh, João Pessoa is the capital, and it's small compared to the other um, capitals in Brazil, but it's actually bigger than Wellington. Um, but it's actually really small compared to the other parts. And winter looks like that. <laughs> so you can understand um, that I actually am not very used to the weather here yet. Uh, we have 25 degrees in winter, and for us it's actually cold. 25. In, in winter, which we call not winter, but rainy season, yeah. Uh, and then over summer, it's around 35, 37. So it's quite nice and warm, good to be at the beach. Right, um, I did my degree uh, in psychology at the University, uh, Federal University of Paraíba. And also I did my master's there in social psychology. And I came to New Zealand to do my PhD in environmental and cross-cultural psychology at Victoria University. And now I work there as a doctoral admissions advisor. Um, I'm not going to give you any talk about this academic part. So probably this presentation will be much more interesting than the academic boring presentations that I'm used to do. Right. So. Um, Festa Junina, it's believed that Festa Junina comes from the influence of the European colonizers in Brazil, uh, particularly the, um, the Portuguese colonizers. They arrived first in Porto Seguro in Bahia, which is also a state in the northeast, and that's one of the reasons that we believe that's why the northeast has such a strong tradition with the Festa Juninas. Later on, the capital of Brazil moves to Rio de Janeiro, and then we have Brasilia. But that um, Salvador, in fact, was the first um, capital of Brazil when the Portuguese arrived. And then when they come, they bring all the influences that they had in Portugal. And one of the celebrations that was very traditional in Europe uh, was actually um, to celebrate the harvest of the crops, right? So they usually had... Uh, a party or uh, a festival that was people reunited around the bonfire uh, with music, with dancing, uh, and where they celebrate the goddess June, which is in the Greek mythology era. And June is the, um, Juno is the, uh, the goddess of fertility, of the mother, motherhood, so that's why they related that festivity with the, uh, the harvest of the crops. Later on, with the, um, um, the expanding of Christianity, um, uh, some of those manifestations of uh, uh, celebrations were actually um, mixed with the Catholic um, celebrations. In this case, the June, festi the June festivities uh, celebrated um, the birth of St. Anthony, St. John, and St. Peter. And then we remain using the bonfire as one of the, uh, the symbols of that celebration, which was uh, previously used as a pagan um, 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 celebration. So St. Anthony, um, the, the whole th symbolic thing around Juno and, and Hera 
was then transferred to St. Anthony. And St. Anthony, Anthony is considered until now as one of the, the saints that you pray for if you wanted to get married. So during the month of June, some people actually do some um, 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 kind of um, promises to St. Anthony in, um, in order to try to get married or that St. Anthony facilitates them to get married. Um, St. John is the saint of um, taking care of the animals. And St. Peter is the saint that takes care of the fishermen and the house and is also one of the founders of the uh, Catholic Church. So while before the June festivals had a character that was much more a pagan character, later on uh, it becomes also a Catholic celebration. And then you will see, for example, in the streets of Brazil during this time of the year, the, the um, outdoors with uh, St. John, St. Peter, and St. Anthony um, for that reason. So the, the region in Brazil that's stronger is the northeast of Brazil, that part in uh, blue. But also the June festivities, they happen in many other parts of Brazil, in the north, in the center east, and also in the south of Brazil. Of course, with different um, symbols, with different um, things that were incorporated later on. But has a very, very strong um, background in the northeast of Brazil. One of the reasons as well that people celebrate this month, um, while in Europe they celebrated the end of summer, in Brazil people would celebrate the beginning of winter or the rainy season, um, as I was talking about before. For one reason, in the interior of the northeast, it's typically dry during the summer. And then so for these people, it's really, really important and really, um, it's really a very happy um, moment when the, the rain comes because that means fertility for the soil and then uh, growth of the crops. And I remember when um, I used to travel a lot to the countryside of Paraíba with my, my parents. Um, um, they were from Campina Grande, which is a city in the countryside. And I was born in João Pessoa. And I remember my mom always saying that. We used, we used to go that always in June, during the month of June for the school holidays. And she used to say, uh, that's the time of the year that the, the, the landscape looks happier. And you can see actually the difference. It makes a huge difference. So, uh, the June festivities um, are surrounded by a theme, which is typically the, a marriage, okay? That is a wedding happening, and this wedding, it's also related with the symbol of fertility. Usually, the, the, um, the, the, the girl that's getting married, they, she's already pregnant, usually to give also uh, this relation with the fertility. And also everything is really comic, you know, everybody uh, plays around and makes fun of the whole um, situation. Especially when the, um, the dad of the, 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 of the girl comes in and discovers that she's actually pregnant. So that is the whole, a whole theatrical uh, thing around it. Uh, another thing that's characteristic is that um, we dress up as people from the countryside. Of course, trying to stereotype a lot of like those um, um, characteristics. But you see like kids uh, dressing up as um, people from the countryside, you know, with the straw hats, with the, the hair uh, in plaits. And these are things that actually comes or goes from generation to generation. So that's me at school. Um, celebrating Festa Junina and my brother over here. And that's my niece now in Brazil celebrating Festa Junina. So we go through those phases in life and all the other kids that are growing up now also remain celebrating um, at this time of the year in the same fashion. So as I was talking about before, the, um, the bonfire is a very important element of this um, uh, festival. Uh, we lit the, the bonfires on the street um, in the day before of the, uh, the birth of those three saints. And usually people that have someone in the house or in the family, uh, which is named as one of those saints, Peter, John, or Anthony, uh, they usually to have 
a bigger bonfire than the others. So my dad is Peter, and then in, in St. Peter's birthday, we would actually lit a huge bonfire compared to the other people in the neighborhood. Also, there is a tradition of using the um, uh, fireworks. Um, and it's believed that this comes from the Chinese influence, actually, in Brazil, uh, which I didn't know, but it was quite surprising for me. And it makes total sense, because the Chinese people, they, they, uh, um, they discover or they made the, the, the gunpowder that we, we use to, um, for the uh, fireworks. And also, the balloons, the balloons that were lit in San João, uh, Festa Junina, uh, they are also from this tradition, from the Chinese tradition, which makes actually, uh, when you see those um, lanterns that, in, that have in Asian countries, it makes a lot of sense as well. Okay, so what about music and dance? This is a big part of the whole Festa Junina thing, and it's one of the um, prettiest moments as well. And the biggest uh, uh, celebrations where you see like people dancing are exactly on those dates, St. Peter, St. John, and St. Anthony. But throughout the whole month, there will be parties and celebrations also leading to those dates. So for example, in Paraíba, we have a 30-day long festival. And it's the biggest festival. So imagine having parties every single day. It doesn't matter if it's Monday. It doesn't matter if it's Wednesday. It's party every single day. People still work, OK? <laughs> Just to let you know, they still go to work. So um, regarding the traditional type of dance for Festa Junina, um, we have what we call quadrilla. The quadrilla also comes from the European influence, um, especially from uh, England with the square dance, uh, which means that uh, there are four couples organized in a square, and then they do the moves and the steps according to someone that calls them what they do, uh, and they change seats, they change uh, places. Uh, this type of dance then uh, was spread in, in France, and that's why what we call quadrilla comes actually from a French word, quadrille. Not sure if my pronunciation is correct, but if there is any French speakers here, help me. Cowder. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> Nothing close to what I said, thank you. Uh, but the, this type of dance, the square dance, also was very um, popular in Canada. That's a picture from the 1940s in Canada and in the US. And remains of this kind of dance was also found um, in the Caribbean. In Brazil, um, as I said, there is different connotations. We have then the quadrilla itself, the dance itself, and around that dance, the whole theatrical thing uh, about a wedding that's happening. And you usually have more than only four um, um, pairs, couples dancing. And these are quadrillas that actually ha um, happen to be, there is a whole um, competition around it. So throughout the whole month, you will have a quadrilla from your community, uh, usually from your neighborhood, that will compete with the other neighborhoods in the city, and then the cities will compete with other cities in the state, and then the states will compete in the finals for the best quadrilla um, of the Northeast. So these are the, the, the most um, uh, professional ones that actually compete, while these first ones are the ones that you see in every street in Brazil if you go there uh, around this time of the year. So it's actually also an important moment for the families and the neighbors get together and enjoy together this, the, uh, um, these uh, festivities. So that's more. This is in my, um, my state. And I wanted to show you what it feels like, what it's actually look like um, with moving, movements, with sound. So I'll just play a short video quickly so you have a little um, idea, hopefully. I'll play first the most um, local type of quadrilla, okay? 
And then you, you're going to hear some of the words um, that the person is calling um, what they're supposed to do. Some of those words are actually French words, or they are um, from the French um, etymology. <laughs> Okay, so that's just to give you a sense what it's like. Um, um, and then you have like these kids actually training for that event, for that moment, throughout the year. I did that, it was quite embarrassing, but <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, so this is for the quadrilla that goes into competitions, okay? Um, yeah, so they are actually in my state. Um, at least 300 quadrillas in this level, in the level of competition. So it's a really, really big thing. Um, and it's very, very pretty to see actually in this space where um, they allocate only for this kind of competitions. Another thing that uh, happens in Maranhão, Maranhão is another part of the Northeast, and they have a different celebration for the, the June festivals. Um, for them, there is a symbol of, the, um, of a cow, and then it is, uh, it is related with a story um, from the slavery, um, the time of slavery. So, according to the story, um, there are two, um, the two slaves, uh, one, Lady was, the lady was pregnant, and the husband uh, wanted to actually give her um, something that, I, that she really, really wanted. In Brazil, I don't know um, if it's the same here, but in Brazil, we believe if the lady is pregnant and if she has a, a, a wish, especially if she wants to eat something that she really wants, um, someone has to get it for her. Otherwise, the baby is going to be born with the face of that. So you don't want a death, and then you make your husband to do that for you. And then she really wanted to eat the, the tongue of the cow. That's what she wanted. Um, and the only way that he could actually get that for her was to kill uh, the cow of the, uh, the farmer owner where he was working at, right? Um, and then what happened after that is that the owner finds out um, the only way for him to get out of that situation, otherwise he would be punished, was actually try to resuscitate the cow. And then he brings in all the indigenous people around that area um, and all the, uh, the, the other slaves that had some connections, the spiritual connections, to try to resuscitate the cow. And the whole celebration is around this event. It's actually uh, what they do and how they, uh, uh, they move around with the cow, so then the cow gets resuscitated. And I just want to show you as well what it looks like. Um, they have also a very um, specific type of musical instrument, which is, which is actually only from uh, Maranhão. <laughs>
Okay, it's just for you to have actually an idea of what I'm talking about. So you could see actually the indigenous elements as well, the people with feathers and so on. It's uh, to make a, a, a reference to the indigenous people. But besides the quadrilla, we also have a very typical type of um, um, dance, which is called forró. Um, forró, actually, um, there are two versions of the uh, origin of this word. So some people believe that the forró comes from forrobado, which is a Portuguese word and means a party that's so fun that no one can control it. Um, and I kind of like think that's related. So for Hobodó, uh, then got shortened in Brazil and then became only for Hobodó. Another version of the origin of this word is uh, from the English term for all. And in this case, there is a story that um, English um, um, engineers were uh, contracted to work in Brazil in a highway um, in Recife. Um, and then they used to promote parties to all the employers. And then when they would actually um, advertise the parties, they would put a sign outside and say, for all. And then people translated that as for all. So these are the two um, um, versions of the origin of this word. It's a type of dance that you can see that is no body space whatsoever between the people. It's very close to each other. Um, there are actually, for her is a universe of different rhythms. So usually what we have in terms of music, it's a group formed of three important men. One playing the zabumba, the percussion part, one playing the triangle, and the other one playing the sanfona, which is a very important part of the, of the, the music. Um, the three types of rhythms that actually compose the forró are short, chachado e baião. And the best way actually to explain to you what each one is about is to show you also short um, videos of how they do it. So for the shorty, um, it's also a rhythm from European influence. And you will see it's, um, it's quite cadenced. It's kind of um, um, a two to one side and two to the other side. And there are variations just around these two steps. Shorty, which is um, a traditional dance in the south of Brazil, actually, and has the, the same origin of the shorty from the northeast. And you see the same type of um, movements.
shot is faster and also there is no two to one side to the other side. You have much more uh, one forward, one backward and all the spinning. And then we also have chachado, which is actually a traditional dance from the cangaceiros group. Um, cangaceiros were a group um, that um, fighted against the political si situation in Brazil at the time. Um, and uh, the main reason for them to do that was based on the fact that the people from the rural areas were exploited by the owners of the land. Um, and, though, and then though they, they created this group and they remained um, on clandestinity um, in Brazil. So chachado, it's a much more stronger type of uh, step. Um, it's faster as well, but it's very typical from um, that group. <laughs> So this is the group that actually um, spread the shashado type um, and these are the ones that are doing nowadays. Um, and then Luis Gonzaga, Luis Gonzaga was the one that actually spread around the whole Brazil the Bayon. The Bayon was that one that was faster paced and with a lot of spinnings that we saw. Um, and he, he actually is considered the one, the king of Bayonne, because he brought Bayonne from the northeast to the center east and made the, the northeast and the Forró famous um, um, nationally. Now, the, the, the delicious part of the talk. So let's talk about gastronomy, which is also a very important part um, of the, the, the June festivities. Um, not only, food is not only an important part of June festivities in Brazil. Actually, food is an important part of any kind of fest festivities in Brazil. So in, in the June festivities, we have a specific type of food that's usually made out of corn, um, but also we have a lot of things that are incorporated and in from the... Um, um, African and the indigenous tradition. So in the northeast we have pasoka, which is this kind of sweet thing made out of um, um, peanuts. And then we have pedimuleki, which is basically the feet of the, 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 um, the child. And these two specifically, they are from the, the, the African um, influence. While also we have the tapioca, which is from indigenous influence. Tapioca is made of, uh, it's kind of like a, a tortilla, but made of cassava flour. And we have the traditional uh, food made out of corn. Here, for example, kanjika, which is that type of thing. And you guys tried as well here, the, the white stuff in the little pots. Um, in, in the Northeast, especially on my region, it's yellow because of the, the type of um, um, corn that we use. And that's pamoya, which is also a sweet stuff. And it's um, cooked in the, in, the, in the leaves of the, the corn. Oh, and that's what I had to talk to you about. <laughs>